from Jordan Hare Stadium to Auburn Arena. From the Plains to the recruiting trail and all points in between. If it's Auburn, we've got it covered. Did I say War Eagle? Or War Eagle. That's it? War Eagle. This is the Auburn Undercover Podcast with Brandon Marcello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Auburn Undercover Podcast. Here early in the week, we're trying to do more podcasts here at Auburn Undercover throughout the week, even throughout the offseason of football. Obviously, basketball's picking up right now. Baseball's about to start. Softball has already started, albeit a 3-2 uh, and two start with two bad losses. I'm wondering about the softball program right now. But we're not going to talk about softball today. Breaking news on Monday involved Calvin Ashley, the former five-star Offensive tackle, you all know him. I mean, high expectations when he came into Auburn in the class of 2017. Rated the number 10 overall recruit in Auburn history since 1999, according to the 24-7 sports composite. He was expected to come in and compete, maybe immediately start at right tackle. Um, Didn't work out. He came in a little bit overweight. Didn't work out. Then this past season was a strange one. Uh, He came in battling Austin Troxel for the starting spot at right tackle. Jack Driscoll, the graduate transfer from UMass, instead wins the job. Troxel becomes the backup, and Calvin Ashley's left floating in space, and no one really knows what's going to happen with him. Well, long story short, he's transferring. He's leaving Auburn, as most of you already know. Um, Not unexpected. In fact, a lot of you were expecting this from the moment he got on campus. Um, The kid has moved around a lot in his life. I I can't even remember and tell you how many high schools he's attended um, when he was being recruited. He was hard to track down by coaches that were recruiting him. Um, One of those situations where you just kind of felt like it wasn't going to pan out and you wondered about the star rating. And I'm not talking bad about the kid, but if you look at it objectively and we talk about rating kids and rating them by stars and everything, I don't know how you rate him a five-star considering everything that was going on with them. But having said that, he's leaving. And this past season, he started one game. You guys might remember it. This Mississippi State game. It was a 23-9 to loss for Auburn. Jack Driscoll had a knee injury that he suffered the week previously against Southern Miss in the second half, and Ashley had to come in and play, I believe. So he started the Mississippi State game. Chip Lindsey, then the offensive coordinator, he's gone too. (laughs) Notice a trend here, all these people leaving. Uh, Chip Lindsey said at the time, you know, it was a mixed bag um, of what he did and did not do correctly against Mississippi State, but he said he's got to keep it up because they're going to count on him more. Well, they didn't count on him anymore. Uh, The very next week, he was out against Tennessee. The explanation, the official explanation at the time was a medical issue. Uh, I got a very good reading on what that medical issue was, decided against reporting it. It was a very personal matter. Um, I still believe it's a private matter, and I'm not going to go into details or rumor mongering about it right now, but it was an issue he's got to deal with in his own life. Um, but so he sat out the rest of the season, did not play another snap. In fact, in December, he straight up just left the team and was, uh, at least according to his social media accounts in, in Orlando, Florida, where he went to school, one of the schools, um, and, uh, I guess was with his girlfriend or something. I believe he's expecting a child. Um, so he was there during the ball game. Well, last week, flash forward to last week, right? I'm interested in knowing what's going on with Calvin Ashley, as a lot of you are. I mean, I kept being asked all over the body to get a message board at auburnundercover.com. Hey, you need to ask about Calvin Ashley. Well, I forgot to ask Gus Malzahn about Calvin Ashley, but I did some digging, and I was told, hey, he's still here. He's still with the team. He's working out, and our expectation is he's going to practice uh, in spring when it starts March 18th. Well, just a few days later, on a Monday, we went from a Friday to a Monday. Uh, I was told straight up, or was that Friday? Or am I mixing my days up? That was, I think, signing day. So it's been 
since last Wednesday. I should I should correct myself. Last Wednesday, I was told that. Uh, put it up on our message board, then wrote a story about it on Friday for others to read. But our body get a VIP members, we all love you, uh, got the word first that they're expecting him to be back. Um, he had returned to the team, was participating in activities. Well, then Monday, I get word. Um, uh, it was about 20 minutes, 30 minutes before Calvin Ashley officially announced it. And I was trying to do some more f- further confirmation. I was looking uh, to a source that has access to the NCAA transfer portal to see if he was actually in the portal, but he wasn't. But I ran a story saying, hey, uh, he's expected to leave. His career's over. Five stars leaving Auburn and Calvin Ashley. And then sure enough, he like tweeted it, I think, like either like 30 seconds before I put the story up or at least tweeted the story or 30 seconds after or something like that. But um. Who cares? That's the background of it all um, with the reporting. But, yeah, he, he's leaving. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who, like, tries to pick him up, who picks him up, who wants to try that. I don't know. Does he want to be closer to home? What is home for him? Is it Orlando? Is it Washington, D.C., where he was at for a while? Maryland, maybe? Maybe follow the Byron Cowart path? And speaking of Byron Cowart, this is amazing to me. Auburn has signed nine five-star players in the Gus Malzahn era since you know the 2013 class, his very first one at Auburn. Nine five-star players. Three of them have left the program, have transferred out. They didn't just leave the program early, go to the NFL or anything like that. No, they transferred. Byron Cowart, the defensive end who really didn't amount to anything at Auburn or really, for that matter, at Maryland. Um, Rock Thomas, who you guys remember, running back at Auburn, had a fumble in the Iron Bowl his freshman year, and then that was really the only memorable thing he did at Auburn. If you want to, like, impactful thing, if you really want to think about it, transfers to Jacksonville State, had a nice little career there, eclipsed 1,000 yards, I believe, in his final season, and now he's in the NFL, and now – Mr. Calvin Ashley, it's uh, it's it's not a it's not a good look when you're losing all these five star guys. And by the way, they're all on offense. And I was talking to a buddy of mine about this, a guy who really follows Gus Malzahn's recruiting, because we've been told about how much Gus Malzahn oversees, obviously, the recruiting for the offense and picks and chooses guys. Uh, supersedes the uh, decision-making of even position coaches on who they recruit and everything. And he has not had a good, uh, I guess, baseball you know, average, so to speak, uh, on, on recruits over the years. Um, you try to think of recruits who have panned out, and there aren't very many on offense. Nick Marshall panned out, junior college guy. Jarrett Stidham panned out, transfer. Uh, carry on Johnson's really their big success story at running back receiver Duke Williams, but then he got kicked off the team. Javon Robinson looked like he had a promising future kicked off the team. Uh, Brayden Smith success story along the offensive line came in as a freshman started the bowl game in the Outback bowl and was off and running from there. And that was a JB Grimes guy, by the way, he found him in Kansas, a place where Auburn does not recruit. Um, But I have a hard time finding guys on the offensive side of the ball that have come in and have been big time stars straight out of out of high school. Maybe I'm missing folks. And obviously, we have not yet seen the end of these receivers that are here now. Um, another guy you could look at, obviously Ryan Davis set a, set a record for most catches in a season, but wasn't like explosive. But if you're looking for like a guy that just put the world on fire, was all SEC at a skill position on offense, it's pretty difficult to find. And even on the offensive line, you could say, you know, John Coleman, but he, he just kind of held things together. Um, But who among all these players that Gus Malzahn's recruited since he's been head coach on offense have like really panned out and like lived up to those rankings, four and five star rankings. I I still think these receivers that they have, 
um, are going to live up the hype. I mean, Seth Williams, Anthony Schwartz, they have the potential to do so. Sean Shivers, another guy running back. But who's going to be that guy? I mean, offensive production has tailed off, really, other than 2017 or the last few years. And 2017, that was with a cobbled together offensive line with a graduate transfer at center in case he done. And then also you had um, a transfer from Baylor and quarterback Jarrett Stidham. The, the star, I guess, the stars in that offense that Gus got out of high school were Ryan Davis and Kerryon Johnson. Um, I guess what I'm saying, I know it sounds negative, but you got to have a better success rate. And then when you do get these five-star guys, make sure that they're the type of character guys that you know will stick around for you um, and be successful too. Because Byron Cowart and and Calvin Ashley did not fit the mold. I think Rock Thomas could have, but things worked out the way they did. There wasn't a lot of you know, goodwill there. And hey, you could even weigh in on Asa Martin, who wasn't a five-star guy, but was a highly recruited guy, Mr. A- Mr. Alabama um, here, and he wasn't even here a year. Left left, left school and went to Miami because he wasn't happy with the way his redshirt th- uh, status was handled. At least that was part of it. So now Auburn's in a position where the offensive line was already thin. We all know that. They're starting fives returning, but then you start looking down the line you know, I, I was asked this earlier uh, before recording this podcast: was how many how many scholarship guys does Auburn have at the, along the offensive line? Well, the answer by my count, including this incoming class, is fifteen, which sounds like a lot, but a lot of these guys have yet to contribute or have barely contributed. Whether you know, uh, obviously, a freshman like Cameron Stutz hasn't contributed yet, um, but they don't have really. They've got bodies, but I don't know if you would say it's depth, especially experienced depth. They have their starters returning, but, man, you're really hoping Calvin Ashley could turn it on and not only help with depth, but potentially be a starter maybe. Or if someone got injured, be the starter and be someone that could dominate. And Auburn just does not have a dominant offensive lineman on this team as of now. Now I say that and I run into Prince Tego want to go, you know, at, at a media event uh, a week or so ago. And the guy is humongous. You just see him and go, wow, that's an NFL player. It he's got potential at left tackle, but they've got, they've got to, they got to have a better success rate with these five-star guys. Don't you think? And, and Calvin Ashley was something that was like, it was like the writing was on the wall from the beginning. And I don't know. It's just sad. I hope he gets. I hope he gets his life together and gets everything together and figures out what he wants. Because man, I hate it when people uh, waste their talent um, and other things get in the way. I know how it can be. Listen, I nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. Things happen to me that slow me down from um, um, achieving what I want to achieve, or I can't reach the moon, or whatever you want to say. But, um, you know, good luck to Calvin Ashley. It just didn't seem like it was a good fit from the beginning. Ne- it just never seemed like it. Um, same with Byron Coward, if you remember that whole thing on signing day a few years back when where everybody was waiting on his paperwork after he announced he was coming to Auburn. Nothing seemed right with that from the beginning. And uh, here we are again. Gus Malzahn, three of his nine, 33%. Or that's that's greater than 33%. I'm not good with math. What's three of nine? <laughs> I'm, I'm bad. But maybe it is 33%. Anyway, three of nine five-star guys have just left. And and th- those those are not guys that are spread out like really over six years. Those have happened recently over the last few years. It's not good. It's, it's not good for a sign of stability, especially if you're an athletics director and you're – listening to this or you're mar- making markings of successes, which got smiles on had plenty, but then also the the cracks in the armor. It's things like this in recent years that have really bothered fans and will obviously be brought up if say this next season were to go South, but that's way ahead of us. And obviously this is just one player leaving one player does not make a team. Um, 
speaking of people who have left, we talked about uh, you know Chip Lindsey left. Now he's a head coach of Troy after a pit stop at Kansas as offensive coordinator. Uh, Tim Horton, who was fired, uh, say whatever you will, demoted, whatever. He was pretty much fired. He was told, hey, you're not going to be running backs coach anymore, but you can be an off-the-field guy. Tim Horton didn't want that. I've been saying that from the beginning, and I've been getting ridiculed by people going, oh, you don't know that. Oh, I, I know that. So anyway, got word Wednesday, or what's today? Monday. I get all my days mixed up. I could have sworn yesterday was Friday. I am out of it, guys. All right. Monday, I got word uh, from someone, uh, two people actually, that Tim Horton's in the running uh, at Vanderbilt uh, to pick up a spot on the staff there. They have two positions open, from my understanding, a running backs coach and a special teams coach, which is right in, in Tim Horton's wheelhouse. That's what he's coached most of his life, at least in the SEC. So don't be surprised if you see him land there in the next, uh, or this week, I guess, at Vanderbilt. Um, uh, I like Tim Horton. There, I, I mean, a lot of people like Tim Horton. He's a very nice guy. I think he did a great job at cultivating relationships with high school coaches and, and commitments and, and players, guys that he wasn't even recruiting. That, that Auburn's going to kind of miss a little bit. But... Uh, Gus Malzahn made the decision to uh, move forward and get Cadillac Williams. It'll probably even out. Cadillac Williams might even have an extra step on Tim Horton just because of his background. And, hey, he's a former player. He can relate with these kids. Hey, I've been through it before. And that'll help Auburn out because everybody knows who Caddy is. But uh, good luck to Tim Horton. I got word of that. I don't know if anybody's reported it, but uh, I'm hearing Tim Horton to Vanderbilt is a possibility and it could happen this week and happen very soon. Uh, moving on to, to Auburn basketball, which is obviously the thing that's going on right now, but it's not really dominating headlines because Auburn's just been a roller coaster this season. They haven't been quite consistent. And if my understanding is c- correct, you know, uh, the NCAA started this thing up, I guess, a couple of years ago where you have quadrant games, like a quadrant one win is the best win you could type, kind of get. Quadrant two is pretty good. Quadrant three, if you have a quadrant three loss, it's bad. It hurts your resume. Well, Auburn's problem all season has been trying to get quadrant one wins and quadrant one games, to be quite honest. And Auburn, for a little bit, had a quadrant one win. And it didn't necessarily happen right after it happened, though. Remember when Washington came to Auburn, Auburn beat them by 20-something points, and uh, Washington was ranked at the time? Well, Washington's not as good as they were, or at least perceived to be then. Well, Washington, for about a week, moved into the Quadrant 1, uh, I guess, uh, area for the NCAA. But now I think they've been knocked out. So Auburn's still kind of looking for that Quadrant 1 win. They could have gotten it at LSU this past weekend, and they didn't get it. They lost. Um, Auburn fought back. They had a chance. But LSU just had them outmatched. And what we're seeing with this Auburn basketball team right now is a team that needs a big man in the worst way. Because, listen, when those three-pointers are falling, we all know, Auburn looks unstoppable at times. But the problem is, and Bruce Pearl will probably tell you this, and because he's mentioned this before in previous seasons, you got to work inside out to be successful in offense, and Auburn's not doing that. They don't work inside out because they don't have an inside guy to feed it to and then bounce it back out, do whatever, to draw attention to the paint. But Austin Wiley should be that guy. He needs to be that guy. But Austin Wiley's been injured again. It's his third injury with his lower leg in the last year. Now, he's back. He's been cleared to play. But he only played three minutes at LSU and got three fouls. I don't know if he was pulled necessarily because of the fouls or also because the leg was bothering him and he was slow and rusty. But I almost say this right now. I believe the time is running out on Austin Wiley's uh, potential to make a mark at Auburn. He's played a season and a half uh, his freshman year. Then he sat out last year because of the FBI stuff. And then, which none of you want to hear about, of course, but it happened. And now he's back on the court now and he's getting injured. And even when he's been on the court, he hasn't been dominant. I mean, we kept hearing about how he was a dominant force by Bruce Pearl and others, how he was a second-round, maybe first-round NBA draft pick. I haven't seen that from him. This year, 
I hadn't seen it from him in off-season workouts. And definitely we're not seeing it right now. But here's the thing. He needs to live up to those expectations. He's got the talent. Because if he doesn't, Auburn might miss the NCAA tournament, guys. Or if they make it, will be a one-and-done. Or at the very best, um, you know, go to two games then, but not make the Sweet 16. Because Auburn cannot cannot shoot 35, 43 pointers a game and just hope they go down every time. And then maybe force a lot of turnovers to get fast break points. Auburn needs an inside presence. Anthony McLemore is not that guy right now. He's not the same type of player he was last year before he injured his ankle. He just isn't to me. Austin Wiley's got to be that guy. They got to feed the ball to him, work inside out. And that all depends on him being healthy too. But if he's healthy, he's got to live up to expectations. And I've mentioned this to other colleagues uh, while watching games with Austin Wiley back when, even when he was healthy. And maybe it's just me. Listen, I am not a basketball coach. You know, I, I've even joked with Bruce Pearl at press conferences. Hey, man, I have blind eyes when I see this. And he'll go, oh, no, you don't have blind eyes. You're exactly right. So I'm right every once in a millennia. But – with Austin Wiley, I've always noticed that he just seems very awkward with his hands whenever he's being fed the ball or he's trying to make a move. It's almost like he doesn't quite have the coordination um, that he needs. Maybe it's just me, but it just he looks awkward in there in the paint when he's fed the ball sometimes. And Auburn really does need a true back-to-the-basket center because, as I said, they got to feed it in. And so he can push it back out and give it to an open guy. And then Auburn needs drivers. They need drivers to the basket. Samir Dowdy could be that guy, but I don't know if he's got um, the athletic ability to jump and be able to reach beyond a block. Because he gets blocked a lot as a guard driving to the basket. Bryce Brown, I think, can be that guy. He can drive to the basket, I think. Jared Harper definitely is that guy who can drive to the basket. Jared Harper, smaller guy but super athletic, blows past everybody. But I think Auburn gets stuck in this idea of let's just take the open shot, take the open shot. And then every now and again, they'll try to work in some stuff where they're they're attacking the basket. But the key for Auburn is they've got to have a true presence in the paint, and they don't have it right now. Even when Austin Wiley's healthy, yes, he's had some good games, but he hasn't had that huge breakout game where he's like, wow, 28 points and 10 rebounds? What you know, something like that. It ha- it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened in his career. He's averaging nine point six points and five point five rebounds this season. Free throw percentage is bad. I thought it was, was better than this. Fifty nine point seven percent. He's averaging guys only fifteen point nine minutes, so sixteen minutes per game. Of course, that includes games like the three minute game and what did he play like? Five minutes, five minutes uh, in the game previous. So with all that said, uh, and he averages 1.6 blocks per game, which is huge. That's something Auburn needs in the paint. A little bit of defensive presence, but he's got to pull down boards. He needs to score. Um, But, you know, he's a guy who's played 17 games who only has five starts this season, and that's because Auburn was starting out hot with Anthony McLemore in the rotation. Then when Austin Wiley got put back in, then he got injured. So Anthony McLemore is back in the starting lineup. It's just uh, it's a frustrating career watching Austin Wiley right now. I hope he puts it together because I think he looks phenomenal physically and it looks like he's got all the tools, but it, it, it just hasn't been put all together, you know? And I, I wonder if he'll ever get it there uh, while, while he's at Auburn. Maybe he'll probably put it together in the NBA and be, you know, an all-star at some point. But I've just not seen it at Auburn. As of right now, Auburn goes does it to a very important week on the basketball court. Uh, they host Ole Miss Wednesday, an Ole Miss team that beat Auburn on the road earlier this season uh, in Ole Miss. Auburn's got to beat, beat Ole Miss. I think Auburn's got to go 2-0 and this week to keep their seeding uh, strong. I don't think they're going to get back in the top 25 with wins this week against Ole Miss. And at Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt has challenged some teams. In fact, they've had number one Tennessee on the brink at one point earlier this season. But Auburn's got to beat Ole Miss at home, and they've got to beat Vanderbilt on the road. Auburn's got to pick up a couple wins on the road 
especially if they're not quadrant one games. And Auburn needs a quadrant one win in the worst way right now. Um, I'd have to look at it, but Auburn's probably one of the a few, if any, uh, power five teams um, that are in the NCAA brackets, so to speak, right now. If you look at the analysts, that does not have like a quadrant one win or only has one quadrant one win. Now, this website I utilize throughout the basketball season, which I love, is Bracket Matrix. They aggregate uh, 98 brackets, or the number changes throughout the year. But their latest, this is 97 brackets, actually, that involve Auburn. Um, the average seating line is 7.24, which puts them at a seating of number seven. They're the second lowest in that spot. So they're on the cusp of potentially falling down to an eight seed, according to the you know, the procrastinators, procrastinators. What am I saying? Prognosticators, procrastinators. <laughs> I guess some of them could be. Uh, there's, I see one bracket that didn't even include Auburn. The lowest that Auburn was placed on uh, the brackets that did include Auburn uh, looks like it was number 10. Highest it looks to be six um, that I can see. So, you know, we went from earlier in the year where Auburn was like a three seed to Auburn as a seven seed and dropping. Uh, Ole Miss right now, by the way, looks like a number nine seed, according to Bracket Matrix. Alabama, which Auburn has a win against, a 10 seed. Of course, Alabama win was at Auburn Arena, and Auburn's already lost Ole Miss. So beating Ole Miss is huge this week, and they've got to beat Vanderbilt on the road because Vanderbilt, even though they've pushed Tennessee, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they're not an NCAA tournament team, guys. We know that. We all know that. So this is a big week for Auburn basketball. they got to put it together. I don't know if Austin Wiley's going to be uh, healthy or not. We'll find out. I'm sure we'll talk to Bruce Pearl before that game Wednesday night at Auburn Arena, and we'll find out. But um, those are just my thoughts on, on uh, Austin Wiley and this basketball team. Might be a little controversial for what I say, but – you know, Austin Wiley's legacy right now is that whole thing that happened with the FBI, allegedly, or allegedly, you know, with his family, and then just not really producing so far. He's got to start producing. And that's his legacy right now. Now, all of you, you'll be frustrated and maybe even peeved off hearing me say that. I'm, that's fine. But if it continues, that's how he'll be remembered, and you, you guys know that. So we'll we'll see. He's got the talent. He's got to put it together. All right. Um, I'm going to take your questions, a few questions here, here at the tail end of the podcast. I went to Twitter, went to the bot to get a message board. I went to the Mediocre Mafia chat in Discord, which, by the way, are some special members who watch my broadcasts on Twitch. If you don't follow me on Twitch, go check that out, twitch.tv slash Brandon. Marcello, it's where I go live on video and take your questions, and interact, talk Auburn. Um, I don't do it daily, but I do it every now and again. That's twitch.tv slash Brandon Marcello. Um, so go check that out and uh, subscribe or just follow me. We have fun on there. Uh, we call the chat the mediocre mafia. <laughs> and not because of Auburn. It's not a shot at Auburn. It's a shot at me because I've always considered myself mediocre. So the people who are following me and listening to me, I call them mediocre too. We're the mediocre mafia. Um, clever, huh? Not really. Okay, I'm refreshing the message board right now just to see if anybody's asking any questions. I don't think anybody has. Um, oh, hey, man, we got a couple here. We always go with the bot to get a message board and our subscribers first. Okay. Some of these I might not be able to answer completely. Uh, Coach Pink, 7259 from the bot to get a message board at allrundercover.com asks, what have you heard on progress from incoming freshman signees as well as younger guys we haven't heard from much? Appreciate it, Brandon. When will he put this one out? I will put it out right now. What have I heard about the progress from incoming freshman signees? Well, I've heard that Bo Nix has done a very good job in acclimating himself with a team and really getting everybody around him to like him. I've heard that quite a bit. I've heard DJ Williams is a freak, the running back, and coaches are really, really happy to have him, and they're looking forward to see when he, what he can do. Owen Papo, the five-star linebacker that came in, I heard he's a physical freak. Um, I can't remember which player was telling me. Um, maybe it's Jeremiah Denson, I believe. 
he said that he he was do, he set some type of record doing doing squats or something for among the freshmen, not like a school record or anything like that, but physical guys, um, and those guys stand out obviously with the with the incoming freshman class. I'll be interested to hear this summer after the spring how the other guys are doing when they come aboard. And of course, spring practices start March 18th, so we'll hear more about them. But those three guys uh, I have heard a little bit about. Okay, Big Time Tiger, one of our Auburn Undercover subscribers, asks, what are the reasons for refusing to upgrade facilities? I see the need mentioned over and over and over, but no action. Whatever happened to Alan Green? Should somebody do a wellness check on him? Uh, whoa, okay, Big Time Tiger. Um, Well, I, I think uh, this really comes from our Philip Marshall has mentioned it repeatedly in his columns, as he probably should because it's a hot topic, uh, not just among the fan base, but people behind the scenes and I think the number one issue, obviously, is a football complex. Auburn wants to build a football complex. Uh, the word is, from our Philip Marshall, is that there is a plan to provide a master plan to uh, f to the public or to the board. I, I don't know which, maybe both, like in the summer, which will give – Alan Green, really, I guess, almost a year and a half to piece something together since he's been here at Auburn since uh, February 2018. Uh, we'll see. But I, I don't think you need a master plan before you build a football facility or announce it. And I say that because this. Auburn certainly seemed to be on the fast track during the football season, at least early in the football season. The day Auburn hosted LSU – is when I learned that Gus Malzahn donated $2 million to build a practice facility, or, a, uh, excuse me, a football complex. And then, sure enough, Auburn gets beaten by LSU in the final seconds, and it's quiet. Like, no one asked Gus Malzahn about it. And I don't think anybody's asked Gus Malzahn about it since. I don't think anybody's asked him at all. And now it's just the whole thing's quiet, the football-only complex. And then there's other reasons why. I've heard that Gus Malzahn wants to be very heavily involved in what things look like in there. I hear there's pushback from other boosters and everything. It just hasn't been as clean of a, uh, a discussion as it should be. Everybody needs to be pulling in the same direction. And as you guys know, Auburn just seems to be almost step on their own toes at times. Um, everybody needs to pull in the same direction, guys. Auburn's got to get this football-only complex done. Auburn's way behind in the facilities race in football right now. They're way behind, as our Philip Marshall's mentioned, in softball. They're definitely way behind, or they're they're not as far behind, but they're behind um, in baseball. And Philip and I were having a conversation with a, a couple of people with Auburn last week. They are severely behind with track and field. I mean, horribly bad. Um, I mean, they, they they got guys inside um, Beard Eves Coliseum running on like carpet. No Power 5 Division One track program should be doing that. And that's where Auburn's at. That needs to be fixed. they got to figure something out. So that's where it stands. Maybe we'll hear more soon, but that's what uh, our Philip Marshall has reported and also some of the things that I've, I've heard myself. Okay, now to Twitter. Uh, Stephen Godfrey um, <laughs> of SB Nation um, asks, simply, Snyder cut? What he's referring to is director Zack Snyder, and apparently he's got a director's cut version of that old that Justice League movie before he got fired from the project and Joss Whedon came in, who did uh, The Avengers, and took over and made that monstrosity of a Justice League movie. Apparently there's a lot of other things in the movie, uh, Kevin Smith, who's a comic book writer and uh, obviously a director and, and a script writer himself, said he heard some things about what's actually in the Snyder Cut movie um, that we'll probably never see the light of day. Um, I'd be interested in seeing it, but I don't think it would have changed anything. I, I think that Zack Snyder's um, perspective of the DC Universe did not match what the DC universe actually is in the comics and I'm glad he's no longer handling it. And it certainly seems like all Aub Auburn, <laughs> it certainly seems like DC, uh, at least in the film universe is not going to focus on, uh, universe building. They're just going to make single movies and 
Maybe they'll just mention the other characters. Maybe a character will stop by, but I don't think they're going to world build to like some other Justice League movie or anything like that. I, I think those that's done for now. Uh, Jason Deason asks, will Auburn make it to Omaha? Uh, the baseball team? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't see it. I don't see the depth. That's just me. I don't cover baseball, but from looking at the roster and talking to some people, I, I don't see it this year. Um, uh, now, we got some Mediocre Mafia questions from the Mediocre Mafia at Twitch. M5C asks, best guess on who the sixth offensive lineman will be? Uh, second team tackles and if they should be SEC level by 2020. Um, I think Austin Troxel, obviously a tackle. Um, he could be a starter right now, I believe, and he'll definitely be a starter in 2020 when Jack Driscoll leaves at the right tackle spot. Uh, Nick Brahms is another guy. I don't know if he can move around, but at center, he's definitely a good uh, backup there. Uh, my big question marks are at guard behind Mike Horton and Markwell Harrell and whether Mike Horton can actually improve because last season was a bit of a disappointment in my eyes with Mike Horton. Um, so maybe you look at a guy like redshirt freshman Cameron Stutz, who I've heard good things about in workouts. And then, of course, Bro Darius Ham and Tayshawn Manning. Um, can they step up? Uh, Tayshawn missed the entire past season, I believe. I think it was Tayshawn with, an, uh, with a foot injury. We'll see, but I, I think that's kind of how it looks right now. I'm interested in seeing how these freshmen look when they come in, but uh, Cameron Stutz is a redshirt freshman, someone who probably will contribute this upcoming season if what I'm hearing is correct. Matt A. Cara on the Mediocre Mafia asks, are any Auburn defensive linemen who are buried on the depth chart considering a move to offensive line? I know Alec Jackson is, but any others? By the way, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard the Alec Jackson rumor. Um of him moving to the offensive line. And I haven't heard anything about him or anybody else moving to the offensive line. So I don't have an answer for you there. It's possible, but I don't hear anything. As I said earlier, Auburn's got 15 offensive linemen on scholarship. I mean, one guy who hasn't played except for like big, you know, garbage time, Prince Michael Sammons. Remember him? He hasn't panned out. Uh, B. Daughtry of Mediocre Mafia. Thoughts on the possibility of a position change for quarterbacks Malik Willis or Joey Gatewood if quarterback doesn't work out? Uh, I have no thoughts on it because as of right now, Auburn has not thought about it based off what I've been told. In fact, um, talking to the side with Gus Malzahn, he just blatantly said no. They have not thought about that. You know, say Malik Willis doesn't win the job or has a chance they have not talked at all about moving him or Joey Gatewood. That might change after the spring. And, heck, they might decide to go elsewhere or something. I don't know. That all happens after spring, really. But it's not going to happen this during the spring. I don't think you're going to see Joey Gatewood at tight end or anything like that, like that's been rumored. Um, in fact, I, I'd be surprised if they even think about moving guys around in August. So I, I don't see it happening, even though that's a – common, you know, kind of uh, oh, not conspiracy theory, but a common guess by a lot of fans. I don't see it happening. I just don't. All right, guys. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Auburn Undercover Podcast. Thank you for joining me. I've been your host, Brandon Marcello. Make sure to go to auburnundercover.com for full and complete coverage. Go sign up and be a VIP member. Try us for seven days. You don't like it? Cancel it, and it's free. No skin off your back, and hey, no skin off our back. We're cool. You can go elsewhere if you want, but come check us out. Always posting scoops. Um, real quick, I, I wanted to talk about this on the podcast, but I didn't. don't have time, but I went up to Birmingham Sunday and checked out the Birmingham Iron Game. By the way, great atmosphere at Legion Field, by the way. I was surprised by that. Some pretty good football, and um, five former Auburn players on that team. I talked to Ryan White, and I talked to, of course, Kick 6 hero uh, Chris Davis for a little bit. I've got a story from them about getting another chance at professional football after sending out the last couple of years. That story is up for our VIP members at auburnundercover.com. The guy is opening up about life and how this is their they feel like one of their la maybe their last chance as they get up in age because when you get near 30 years old and you're still trying to make the NFL, it's difficult, guys. I mean, it's almost impossible. So, go check out that story, please. I I really appreciate running into them. And I ran into Mrs. former Mississippi State running back Ladarius Perkins, who I covered on my 
first SEC beat full time like eight years ago, and he came up to me and recognized me. So that was great. It was amazing. He recognized me with no hair and and, and a lot of more weight than I had and a big beard. So <laughs> anyway, thanks guys for listening. Check out auburnundercover.com and of course subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you can pick up podcasts out there. Just search for Auburn Undercover. I'll see you down the road. No one has it covered like 24-7 sports. Go undercover with Auburn Undercover. Auburn Undercover.